10.30 I should say, and respecting my colleague Marion Williams who needs to shoot out the door at 11.30 for something else. Um, I think we'll kick off on time if that's all right. Um, in Sydney, we've got um, Stuart Johnson who's going to open. He's our um, TMT leader. We've got Jeremy Drum who's um, a, a partner in our consulting TMT practice, who's the co-author. We have Kate Huggins, the lovely Kate, who is in the TMT <laughs> practice, a partner in consulting as well. Um, on her left, we have Trevor Trian from um, Kaplan Educational. We have Sarah Homewood from um, Ad News. We have Francois Vandermeer from Deloitte, who makes everything in TMT happen. And none of us could live without him. We have Alex Zakharov Root, Reut, said Reuters, Reut, um, who's going to be videoing it from IT Wire, and we have Nick White, who's also co-author of the report, um, and, and me. Um, folks, whilst you're on the phone, I would appreciate it if you just mute until you wanted to ask a question. If there's anything you need to ask on the way through, don't hesitate. We'll kick off. Stu, let's, let's um, start with you. Great. Today. Thanks, Louise, and good morning, everybody. And Thank you for coming today to hear about what is the, the first edition of the um, Australian version of the um, Deloitte Mobile Consumer Survey. And uh, I think what we're gonna to see today is that we've known for a long time that the smartphone has become something that uh, is just part of our everyday lives. But as we walk through today um, and the stats from today, I think we'll see and we, you know, we'll see just how dependent we've become on this device. Um, and you know, the, the term that we're really, um, sort of we're using to characterise the findings is really this whole fear of missing out. Um, we seem to be now living in a world where, uh, as you'll see, we are constantly checking our phones really just for that fear, what well, you would almost term that fear of missing out. Just in terms of the smartphone penetration, we now sit um, as having the fifth highest um, smartphone penetration within the developed world, um, only behind the uh, likes of Singapore, Norway, Spain and Sweden. So well ahead of the, the UK, the US and others. So really now the smartphone is here to stay, that's no surprise, but as we go through this morning's survey, you'll see just what we're using that for. Um, so just a little bit about the survey itself. Um, so we've surveyed approximately 2,000 Australian mobile consumers as part of our global survey. So we have four years of longitudinal data for around 37,000 consumers for this report that span around 22 countries um, and so we're going to look at six trends so as we always try and do for you to try and go through the uh, through the results of our survey and try and bring these back to what are the six or five or six key trends that are emerging and of those trends that we're seeing um, is really firstly and I'll touch on it in a moment this whole notion of how quickly we actually um, connect um, the moments after waking and, and how much we really do use depend upon our phone. Um, we've got some interesting stats that have emerged around smartphones and um, it's almost as we've referred to it a Holden versus Ford type um, <laughs> or Melbourne versus Sydney divide is emerging when it comes to our smartphones and the devices of choice. Um, some very interesting we were just touching on it there before at the start with Alex around just where we're at with messaging versus text messaging and, and a wave that is starting to emerge there. Uh, we've got some interesting stats around Wi-Fi and 4G and also we'll look at banking and some of the other stats and some further stats around social which builds upon our uh, media concern, consumer survey for earlier in the year. So they're the trends, that's a little bit about the survey. So if there are any questions I'll jump straight into the first, uh, first of the, uh, the trends. And the, 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 one of the most standout trends that we noticed when we actually looked at uh, the uh, this year's survey was just how quickly we go and turn to our mobile phone when we wake up in the morning. So the stats that we have for you here, and uh, for those on the phone, I'm on, on slide eight of our um, briefing deck, is that when we wake up in the morning, uh, slide six, sorry. Yeah, the, the numbers are, are wrong, guys. You can blame me entirely. Right, okay. They're just lifted out of the report, which right. will be live online. <coughs> what time, folks? Oh, 11.30. 11.30, because so, it's so, more detailed. So on your, the number on the report would be slide eight, but it's the Wake Up Connect um, slide. And I think, um, slide, the, the key here is just how quickly we turn to it. So 10% of us actually turn to our phone upon waking. But re more importantly, within the first hour of waking, 80% of the those surveyed will have looked at their phone for some reason or another. So whether it's checking social networks, whether it's emails, 
it's that we are immediately turning. So that the smartphone is so much part of our day to now is that we are 30, you know, within, as I said, with 10% immediately, 30% within the first five minutes, and 81% of us within the first hour. And then if you look at the trends there for the younger demographic in the 18 to 24, there's even a higher dependence upon it. So 22% of young people in that age bracket are actually looking at it. The first, it's the first thing they do when they wake up, um, through to 75% within the first 15 minutes. So I think it's just a very interesting stat in terms of just how quickly we are turning. So, uh, sorry, turns to our phone. So if you then look at how often we then continue to use the phone through the day. So if we go to the next slide, um, we're then seeing that um, we're using, um, that we're checking our phone at least twice per hour, um, and then uh, up to 50 times a day for the 50, for 18 to 24 year olds. So as you can see there, the stats that we have is we've got 3% of the population are even checking it 200 plus times. But that, that band between um, up to 25 times is there's a significant proportion of, so over 50% of us are checking our phones at least 11 times a day. So he just underlines again, not only are we turning to the phone to use it, uh, and, and it really shows, I think, that this device is more than just a text tool, or it's beyond a communication tool, it's now become just part of everything we do, it's embedded in our everyday life. Stuart, so you might to add it up. I mean, can, can you say that about 15% of it check it, you know, up to 100, you know, more than 100 times? Well, that's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, absolutely. You, just add it up. you can add that up across there. Yeah. And then you can see the dominance of the, the, as we go through, and it's not surprising that through the, the, the usage is 6%. even higher. 6% check more than 100, yeah. so the 3 plus 3. Yeah. yeah. And then you can see there that it all adds up to over 50%. Yeah. Which which up to up to times. Yeah. So the, the second um, theme we looked at was Stu alluded to the Holden versus Ford uh, rivalry that's going on between Apple and Samsung. Um, the survey respondents uh, suggested that 70% of the market actually is, is captured by those two devices, uh, with Apple ruling out over Samsung around 38 to 32%. Um, there are other devices obviously in the market as well, and those comprise of around 30% of the market. On the next slide, please. Um, so this, this chart is really showing the fact that both Apple and Samsung are doing a great job of actually keeping their customers their user base. So quite brand, uh, brand conscious, brand loyal, quite sticky consumers. How you read this, this chart is, um, if you use Apple as the example, so current Apple device owners, um, so just look at the left hand uh, chart here, almost eight in 10 of current Apple users are coming from an Apple device before. So 80% retention rate, which is just significant. Um, Samsung slightly less at 60%, but the other three main providers obviously falling off quite dramatically around about 25%. And that's something that um, I guess is a really important factor for both Apple and Samsung in terms of how they're just retaining those customers. The other important factor with, um, with smartphones is just what are, we, what are we making our choices on? Um, and, and really the, the main driver that's come through this year is, is really around it's not surprising so with Stu's comments around you know how frequently we're checking how, how often we're using and just our, our dependence on devices <coughs> it's not really a surprise that battery life is is the key driver to the choices like or the choice as to why um, uh, why we're selecting devices so 31 percent of respondents are suggesting that um, battery life is the key factor for them when choosing their next smartphone closely followed um, but but followed by um, price of device um, that, that might be surprising in terms of uh, the cost consciousness, but it's, it's obviously uh, an important one around battery life. The third, so just on that, I think just quickly going back, I, I think the other interesting, the often, the question is often, I thought, what about the bundles? So I think the key here is price of the device yeah. and then the following one around monthly payments. Yeah. So I think price is absolutely conscious of whether it's paying out right or as part of an overall. No, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> so the third trend um, that we've covered off in the report is around the messaging way. And there's been lots of headlines and attention around uh, mobile instant messaging 
uh, some pretty significant valuations in the marketplace. $21 billion purchase by, by Facebook of WhatsApp, um, $10 billion Snapchat valuation. There's, there's just significant um, noise and excitement around what these different uh, offerings provide. Um, however, in, in Australia, I, I'd suggest that it, the wave has not crashed on our shores just yet. Uh, really, Australia's loyalty to SMS is still very strong, with 88% of uh, the respondents um, using SMS versus 25% with them. So we're not quite there in terms of the tipping point. Um, there's obviously great excitement. There's quite a lot of use amongst especially younger population uh, or respondents, um, but SMS is by far our most uh, prevalent use in terms of communication on the messaging, on the messaging side. Um, Importantly to note is uh, the fact that, and just on the second slide, Chloe, is, is, is uh, an important point here around 73% of the 18 to 24 year old population, um, they only use their, their phone for phone calls. So 70, only 73% are using their, their smartphones for actually making phone calls. Uh, this is you know, quite dramatically different here compared to the 35 to 40, 45 year old population, which is closer to 90%. So we're seeing a bit of a drop off in terms of the usage of the usage um, of, um, of the younger generation with, with their smartphone device. Um, in terms of where we rank, uh, Australia, as, as I mentioned, it's still SMS is dominant um, and predominantly uh, MIM is used by the, the younger demographic. Um, and in, in other parts of the world, uh, this, is, this is quite different. So if we look at um, countries like Spain, Singapore, Netherlands, and China, we're actually seeing MIM take over from SMS as the predominant form of messaging. Um, Spain as, as the, the one that stands out quite, quite significantly at 84% of uh, respondents in, in Spain tipping over to MIM versus around 71% using SMS. Um, if you look at US and the UK as, as comparators, so they're a little bit a um, little bit closer to Australia. So the US is, is only around 20% of the population using MIM, uh, using MIM uh, while 85% still on SMS. So we're, we're in that ballpark around the, the, the key thing here too is that, probably two key things. One thing we've seen hold up is our prediction from the start of the year where revenues to carriers and telcos to text messaging still exceeds the, the revenues that are derived through advertising from, from MIMS. So MIMS are holding at about a $20 billion per annum uh, revenue base, whereas telcos and carriers are still making around $100 billion globally from text messaging. There's a couple of things that are driving that. One, the monetization through advertising is just not as great as the, the, the constant message flow um, that the, the, telco, the telcos can actually realize through just you know counts per message. The other is the ubiquity, ubiquitous nature of text messaging. So if you think about, if you want to reach a group of friends and you don't know whether they're on Viber or WhatsApp, you default to text messaging. The other interesting thing within Australia, it was even, I think, came out from the, that quick anecdote at the start, um, Alex, around you know your decision as to whether you're going to use Viber or WhatsApp with your sister who's currently overseas. It's no doubt that the bundling of text messaging has removed the barrier of whether it would, the notion of whether text messaging is costing me or not. Yeah. So the notion of just buying a bundled offer, and it's only when the end user may incur an additional cost, such as when they're overseas, do we start to see the cost choice come in. So it's very much about, um, firstly, who am I trying to reach? Am I trying to reach someone through my social network, which is via generally the mobile instant messaging device, versus I need to reach everybody, which is where I default to for text messaging. So yeah, I mean, she was not using her SIM card overseas, so it made sense to use Viber, which right. had local, yeah. local access. When you say 73% of 18 to 24 year olds use their phone for phone calls and 88% of 35 to 44 year olds. I mean, what are the other 17% uh, doing? Not using it for calls at all, they're just using it as a, yeah. as, yeah. As, a, as, a social. as a personal computer. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's 27% who haven't used their phone yeah, for a call in the last seven days. Right. So they may occasionally use it, but it's not sure, there. Sure. And, and would that include making um, when you're talking about phone calls, you're talking about phone calls through the cellular network. You're not including Skype calls or Viber calls. That they may be doing they may be doing those sorts of calls. They're, they are, but they're not making cellular calls. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which but is fascinating. Yeah. 
Over we the are top seeing where the, the younger demic, the younger the, the younger demographic, are relying more on things like instant messaging for communication rather than voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You just have to anecdotally look at. I just have to look at my teenage son. Mm-hmm. I do myself. How he uses his phone. We, we are using. He uses up his day allowance much quicker than he ever uses up his voice allowance. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot. Even, even using his Wi-Fi, so it's constantly to be. Yeah. Yeah, he's rarely on the phone. It used to be the, about getting. Unlimited calls, but that's we've got that now. Now we want unlimited data, yeah, yeah, which we yeah, haven't yeah. got. That's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not in this country. Yeah, yeah. But even the uses, just watch you. You watch how people are using the phone. Sure. They're using it as a device, as not just for the voice. Like voice yeah. is dropping off as yeah. a in the younger groups. Yeah. Yeah, in the younger groups. So, so is, 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 is data going to be um, big revenue growth for um, telcos here? I, I don't know about uh, revenue growth. I think the notion of the plans are going to become, it, there's going to be less divide about am I using a voice versus text versus data. Yep. I, I think it's more about access to capability that is going to be, that the, there'll be a lot more, blur, this will drive a lot more blurring and, and different, you know, the, because our usage, you can't define it by the, our usage of the telco network based on voice or data, the plans will need to align about that as well. So the, the telcos, no doubt, still face a massive growth challenge and a marketing challenge. Um, so I don't think this is going to convert and all of a sudden be this beautiful world of a brand, brand new revenue stream for telcos. Well, we're all waiting for data prices to drop. Too yeah. expensive. Yeah. Way too expensive. Yeah. So it's happening too slowly. But it's happening. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, section four. We looked at Wi-Fi and 4G and whether or not we can tell the difference. Um, so in here, what, what you can see, the, the, the chart on the left really suggests that our preference uh, of the 100%, you know, our preference is absolutely in the, the Wi-Fi camp. So we, we are attracted to the freeness or the free factor of Wi-Fi despite the fact that we pay for it. We love, we love the fact that we connect through Wi-Fi. Um, you did, this actually does rank Australia in the top half of respondents when we look at preferences. Um, and not surprisingly, the right-hand side just did, looks at the question of, you know, how do you connect your phone onto the internet? It, it gives a, a breakdown of at home, at work, and if in place of study, um, our preference, absolutely. 76% of us are, are wanting to connect through Wi-Fi. Now, the important point on this is that although that's our preference, we're more than happy to jump on our, our mobile network because we have to be connected. Um, and that fear of missing out is really important factor to us. So we obviously jump between one and the other, um, but this question was really around the preferences of where we want to actually connect, and that's what that came through. That's what actually came through there. The other point was, um, in just in terms of the comparison, one of the one of the questions we looked at was, you know, how do you compare the speeds? Um, so is is Wi-Fi a, a faster connection than 4G or 4G versus 3G? Um, and in this, um, the, the three areas that we looked at at home, when you're out and about, and when you're commuting, um, the, the clear message here, you, know, you can see there, is that 4G speeds are faster than all. So respondents very much seeing that the 4G networks are, are coming through as a stronger way to actually connect to the internet, um, which is quite, quite an important factor. But despite that, um, just 8% of respondents listed listed 4G as the most important factor or an important factor when selecting their next network provider. Um, so even though they know that, um, or their, their, their perception is that 4G speeds are faster, it's not a key decision maker in terms of when they're actually jumping from one provider to the next. And quite important there. So the highest in that one was actually the price of the monthly subs. <coughs> Marianne, for you. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. That's fine. For me. So the fifth section, <laughs> the fifth section, which I know a few of you are interested in, is, is where we asked uh, survey participants about their attitudes towards uh, mobile banking and particularly mobile payments, um, uh, and asked some questions about who they trust um, and their willingness or interest in, in, in mobile payment solutions. Um, just just a few stats on where we are. Uh, now in the mobile banking and payment space, 55% of our respondents have used mobile banking to perform 
you know, typically basic banking services. And, and as a nation, we uh, were, were reasonably early adopters in, in terms of our banks offering um, these types of services. Um, so I think 46% 40, of us have used a um, mobile service to check our bank balance, you know, basic transactions, um, uh, money transfers, etc. We're a little bit behind the rest of the world, and in particular Scandinavia and, um, and many Asian countries when it comes to mobile payments. Um, and there's a couple of potential reasons for that, I think. Um, you know, if you look at um, banking technologies in, 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 in the retail space in Australia, uh, we're pretty advanced with things like contactless cards and therefore the kind of substitution um, uh, or convenience argument for adoption of mobile payments is, is, is less obvious here. Um, but when we asked people about their interest in, in a mobile payment solution uh, or using their smartphone to, to pay for goods, uh, there was a decent tranche, 35% who, who answered yes to that. Um, and you know, as a nation, we are um, pretty heavy users of online commerce. And so I think if you look at um, the uh, dependence that we're highlighting elsewhere in this report on our smartphones, plus our propensity to, to buy online, uh, then I think the mobile commerce space is, is, is definitely um, a growing one in Australia. And certainly with increasing adoption of um, iBeacon and NFL technology um, uh, in retailers, that uh, importance of the smartphone in that broader shopping experience um, is going to become more and more uh, central. I think, and I think that's the most interesting point in all of this is the debate of whether is it smartphone versus credit card substitution. We we'll be kind of there, but we're already using our, our credit cards in the first pay wave. It's more as the phone just becomes integral to the shopping experience. There'll be then a need so that you know that why would I pull out if I've been looking at content or I've been using my mobile phone in, within the shopping experience? Why would I then pull out my credit card rather than just simply wave the phone over the um, or use the phone at checkout? So I think it's that 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 whole convergence within the shopping experience that will really drive that next wave of using the, the mobile phone. And we've not highlighted it in this short presentation, but we did ask a question about who do consumers trust. Um, and interestingly, there, despite our kind of love-hate relationship with our banks, um, we do trust um, banks. Seventy-three percent of us would trust the banks over and over and above um, other providing, providers of such solutions. Now, this this research was conducted before Apple uh, announced their Apple Pay um, offering, so we'll we'll see next year whether that has much of an impact. And, that, and that'll be in a deeper um, oh. report, which um, you guys have got a copy of, and I've just flipped it through to you guys on the phone as well. And it'll be live on the, on the web. Thanks for that, Kate. Any questions on that whilst we, we're on the topic? In terms of um, trust, capability, who was second to the banks? Other financial institutions. So PayPal? Visa, yeah. MasterCard. And where did PayPal? Uh, that's that's next. So 26% of respondents um, fall into the financial institutions bucket. 25% money transfer services like PayPal, Western Union, TransferWise, and others. Telco operators, uh, many low down the list, 5% trust in their telco operators, net network operators, and payment solutions. Do you think Apple Pay will change this? Because still, it's, it's still much less of people who are willing to consume mobile phones. Do you think having an Apple Kind of, I guess, jump, change that perception that people are willing rather than not. Yeah, because it's really interesting. We, and we see this whether it's things like mobile payments, um, e health records. The closer you get to reality, the more likely people are to use it. So that as, a, as they can actually see a phone in their hand and they can actually feel this convenience, then they will do it. When you ask the question, when, when reality is a little bit further away, people be, tend to become more conservative and tend not to, they'll answer and they'll answer no. When you get really, so I think if the answer is yes, as you start to see these technologies really mature, as you start to see more things like eye beacons in stores and that, that sort of technology get deployed, the willingness for consumers to actually use these devices will, and use mobile banking will increase. And if, if you think about it, <coughs> so with Apple dominating the younger and the propensity of the younger market to, as it should have been here, 
um, willing to use, you then extrapolate if Apple Pay is a, a viable alternative, then pay waves in banks, there will likely be a shift. Right? You can kind of connect the dots on those things. And, and we did ask what sort of payments would you be interested in, in using your mobile to make. Um, and people focused on things like paying for public transport, paying for parking tickets, paying for fuel, things where it's not that convenient to pay right now. When it comes to your grocery shop, you know, how much easier is it to tap your mobile phone versus your car? Not that much of a difference, mm -hmm. isn't it? Except, as you said, the phone is probably in your hand. Could be. Wallet's probably in your back pocket or yeah. Yeah. somewhere else. I mean, not necessarily if you're carrying stuff. Like that. that could both yeah. be in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> but what's going to be easy to get, probably your phone. But I think uh, how does that go? Oh, sorry. Go on. Oh, and then that of uh, be a relatively quick question about. I guess is this just looking at smartphones? Um, I mean, have you do you have any thoughts on kind of impact of wearable devices on the the payments area? We have we haven't looked at wearables in the context of this survey. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I think the. The question there will still be that most wearables today are still being tethered to a smartphone for connectivity. Um, now there are things like the watches. Now the only thing, which Alex is holding his two up, the only thing we've seen in other surveys is that watches aren't as popular amongst the younger people, amongst the younger generation, I should say. These don't have NFC things in them anyway. It's Apple Watch that's going to yeah, be the first. The Apple that's Watch. Right. That's right. So we're waiting for that. So I think wearables, until wearables have NFC or something integrate a sort of similar technology into them are probably not and until they're standalone like today they are still a device that is re to really be connected it still has to be tethered to a, a mobile the question phone. is which wearable currently lets you pay none <laughs> so yeah. that's the answer to the question but is it likely that wearables will take over from smartphones one day potentially it's yeah. going to come back to the innovation cycle and so I would I would not sit here and say no it's not going to I think it's just there's still early ways with so I think smartphones are most likely. Uh, I, look question, to, Adam. I look forward to trying the Apple Watch. Yeah. Any, any, is, that, is that adequate, Adam? Um, can I yeah, that's great. Can I, oh. Marion, go ahead. My last one is just out from the financial review. Um, oh, just. just been following on with um, what from the banking banking side of things. Did you guys have a look at um, the propensity for people to use uh, Bitcoin wallets or cryptocurrency or anything like that, or was it pretty much just standard? banking with um, partnerships with the telcos and the, and the big retail banks? Yeah, the survey, so this survey, um, we've focused more on how people would use smartphones and mobile devices in the context of mobile banking or other types of transactions. Um, so sure. we didn't look at the platforms per se. I think the okay. only thing you would say is the trust factor and the, the, we cited before that people still put their trust in their finance, they will still put their trust in a financial institution well ahead of um, a Bitcoin or a software or other type yeah. platforms as well. So that'd be the lead indicator. That this, that really those other those other platforms as such as Bitcoin are really gonna have to gain the trust of the consumer before we see anything like mass adoption um, at this point. Right, Just Thank you. story with Ivan on yeah. Thanks for that question. We'll shift along. That's a great question. Aha, social. So this is really out the last, and uh, just to wrap up before we jump into to broader questions. So if we look at um, our ability, well, how much we're using social as uh, with our mobile devices, uh, a key point which came from our uh, mobile, sorry, our media consumer survey earlier in the year was that fifty. 4% of Australians now update or check their social networks daily. And then when we looked at the, um, uh, we looked at this in terms of what, how we use our mobile phones within that and our smartphones, 44% of us are doing so via our smartphones. Um, now, respondents under 45 are using their smartphones to check the social networks uh, are actually, we're out, we're above the global average. Um, but we did still lag many of the countries. So if we look at the chart there on the left-hand side, um, we've seen this chart actually is, is which um, have you done via your phone in terms of social media. So 
64% of the respondents in China to this survey have used their mobile phone to actually um, communicate via a social media channel versus Australia, which is 44%. So we're still using the mobile phone, but it really, this is showing there's a growing dominance of the use of the mobile. But if you think about our use of the PC at work, if you think about how we use other devices in our day, the always on nature is we may not pick up our mobile to update our social channel, we're still, if we're on the laptop, we still go and use the laptop. So it depends, you know, that our use of the smartphone is probably, we use the smartphone many times through the day, but on relatively short cycles, whereas something like the PC is still used for those long form periods or the longer periods. So given the attention or the time we spend on the device, it's not unusual at the moment to actually see that we're not using the smartphone as the dominant device for updating our social channel. Our social, uh, our social networks. And then I think the other thing that we are going to see, and um, it'll be interesting to see if any of you pick up this quote about don't be surprised to be friended by your grandma soon, but I think what we are seeing is still this um, move of the use of social media through the age group. So there's no doubt that you know, we now have um, high, high penetration of social um, in the uh, in the younger demographics right up to um, sort of the 34 um, and whilst it's actually still relatively low in the older demographics we do expect that that will start to lift because the adoption of smartphones is increasing so I think there's a small lag there so we're seeing greater penetration of smartphones in older age groups and the, the, we expect the social media will actually follow from there or social usage will follow from So in terms then of um, us the, at a crossroads, uh, just to, to wrap up, um, so as we said, you know, more than half of us are updating or checking our social media for up to 20 times a day, um, and that's up 170% from last year. Um, so there's an interesting stat in terms of just how often we're now using social. So we've often spoken about how much, how often do we check social within a week or within a month. Now what we're seeing is really the time frame is how often we're updating social per day. So this whole notion of how engaged we are with our social networks. Um, and if you look at the fact that Facebook has <coughs> 13 million unique visitors to their site from Australia or to the apps per day, that's 50% of the total population of Australia is now engaged on Facebook. Um, now in theory, if you then took what the population over 16 is, but I'm sure there are many, there are still plenty of younger people who are that age, the 20 <laughs> year olds. I know there's a neighbour of mine that's 11 and probably is, is definitely on, has tried to friend me on Facebook, but, um, but the, I think the, you know, it just shows the dominance of social um, and then the usage, I think, you know, the key here is that there's, we're at that crossroads of where we will start to see mobile be the dominant uh, device for social update. We're seeing that the growth in the use of uh, smartphones. Yeah, yeah. So just to close out the survey, and I'll hand back to, to Jeremy in a moment to answer questions as the author of the um, report. I think the bottom line here is that um, accessing social media on our mobile is really a core part of our experience for under 35s. Um, but then we'll start to see it become far more integrated into our lives from a shopping perspective, from an entertainment point, entertainment really you know as we move forward and conduct this survey in future years in Australia we really do expect to see this device become uh, even more ingrained in our day-to-day -day life than it, is, than it has already become. Thanks Stu. And um, just we've just um, thrown up the last slide here in the um, in the Sydney telepresence room guys on the phone which is just saying that um, I think Ipsos did the work for us yep. it was about 2000 um, Australians aged between 18 and 75. That's right. Yep. Any questions? So you think it'd be about 10 years before we have the chip directly in the brain with all this information <laughs> coming right in front of our eyes? Will you, will you be the first one to adopt no. it? No. There's a fellow in Melbourne that already has that, I seem to recall, and um, we're using Google Glasses. 
um, in the quest pack in um, New Zealand. Right. I understand. Well, I, I, I mean, I think we, you know, we did talk about that at the start of the year predictions where right. the greatest adoption of wearables is in the enterprise because that's where yeah. the most practical But I mean, the, the logical conclusion is to have an implant. And then we get superpowers, and then yeah. we're, no, we're not humans we, we anymore. Tried, we tried to keep our predictions within twelve months. Cyber. Yeah. But Alex, there is this fellow in Melbourne. Yeah, no, I mean yeah. I've heard of it, but uh, yeah. Lee, you were better ask a question. Yeah, yeah. sorry. With regard to um, this is what we as consumers would do. How prepared is Enterprise Australia for this? Because it strikes me that you know you've got a, a fair sweep of um, mobile applications that have been launched by the bank. Uh, but you haven't, you haven't really seen all sectors embrace this as a vehicle to communicate with consumers in that space. I, I think there's a, um, I mean, we didn't, within the survey, we didn't survey the attitudes of enterprise. I think our observations, though, would be that um, it, it, is very, it is varied. There are some organisations which are turning their attention, but I think the I think the employees are leading the organisation. Um, I think there's no doubt the whole, it, this started with the whole bring your own device trend and it's now continuing through from the applications as well. Um, I mean, I think about our own organisation, it used to be a rule, no Apple devices, and then once the CEO and the whole uh, C-suite started walking around with, with Apple devices, then the CIO had to sit down and work out how he was going to support them. So, but I think the, the consumer-led, whether it's um, within the enterprise or within the market, the consumers will continue to be the leaders and will lead enterprise. So really the question is how does enterprise understand those trends both within its workforce, within its consumer base, so we can follow. So what's your advice to your clients about this? The, the key advice is really is firstly, how do you look to and understand what people are doing and how they're using technology in a way that was potentially unexpected. So I think one of the key trends we've seen over the last decade is the most seismic shifts that we've seen have occurred when someone's used the technology in a way that wasn't necessarily expected, particularly the consumer. And I think smartphones are a great example of a platform which actually follow that through the app stores and it was probably one of the first examples around the ability of the smartphone to actually follow and adapt to people's usage through the, the deployment of smartphones and, and the, uh, sorry, through the deployment of apps. Um, I think the, the most interesting development is the inclusion of NFC in the iPhone 6 because that's the first time the integration now starts to have more device to there's a tighter integration into the value chain between the mobile device and just the app. It's a walled garden. It's a walled garden, but it's a very big garden. I think that's the case. And it's a relatively open garden. It's a relatively it's still open. It's open in so far as there's a closed standard, there's a closed set of standards that you can still provide you work within the set of standards. It provides the reliability. So I think if you look at Android versus Apple, the thing that Android challenges, struggles with is the fact there's reliability of which platform is my app on, or which version is it on, versus there's always that tight control for it. So it's a wall garden in the Apple. In the case of the Apple I, I store, the, the, sorry, the App Store, it has actually driven greater adoption and there's greater stability. There's other issues with it, but so I shouldn't say there's other issues. There's always the user around isn't too close, but it has driven well, it has opened, and also the reports are that um, Google's wallet on Android devices, the usage has gone up because all yeah. of a sudden, because you know everyone was waiting for Apple to bring its thing out, and now it's much more popular than it ever was. I think the really interesting thing for us from this was actually the Samsung versus Apple, how important the device. We always used to talk about Apple versus Android, and, and you now look at the Apple and <coughs> Samsung dominance, and so the, the handset does actually or as much as the platform. The thing is this, you were saying before, this survey came out before Apple Pay. 
it must mean that this survey came out before the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Yeah. So it'll be fascinating to see how many Samsung people defect back to Apple because yeah. they were waiting for a large device. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a key step that Absolutely. Yeah. we have to make. I don't know when that's the next right. report will come. But and it, it, could be, it could be a lag because it could be how quickly does the how quickly is the iPhone 6's features integrating with the you know, install capabilities, so the NFC type capabilities. Sure, sure. But I mean, no one's buying the Samsung because they can use NFC in Australia. I mean, you can't that's use right. Apple. I mean, maybe a few are, yeah. but that's, that's the, uh, the non-availability of Apple Pay in Australia is not the reason why you're not buying or not buying no. an iPhone 6. Part of the problem is you can't get an iPhone 6 to save your life. I mean, you, you've ordered one. I know people have ordered them and yeah. they're still waiting today. Yeah. Alex, uh, folks on the phone, that's Alex from ITY, yeah, sorry. opposed to Deloitte. Pont pontificating, yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry. That's all right, Alex. <laughs> Any other questions? Some more? I just had one question is that um, if, uh, on, the, on the messaging, you know, there's kind of a, there's a variety of different messaging apps out there. There seems to be a new one today Facebook, WhatsApp, Fiber. I mean, do, you, do you expect to see it? kind of a shake-up in, in that market, you know, they're all closed messaging environments as well. I think the most interesting question, we thought about this earlier this year, the most question, interesting question is how are those groups going to monetize the base that they've built? So if you think about what WhatsApp has actually did was, and what was attractive for Facebook was the number of users, not the revenue that it was generating. Now, the re there's a reluctance for those groups then to go and open up the platform, which would actually allow for greater revenue generation because the value that they're placing in their company is the number of users they have, not the revenue they're generating. So there's a real paradox for these guys at the moment is how do they, they to become more open and to compete with text messaging, they're gonna have to be able to be so that it can be more ubiquitous, but then if I go and open up my platform so that my Viber platform talk with my Facebook or my WhatsApp platform, am I actually giving up some value that I'm hoping to have actually realised through you know, a sale to another organisation? So I think that's going to be the, the really interesting. So the, the, you would look at it and think there is going to be some form of consolidation, but it really depends on what's the exit strategy a lot of these guys are hoping for, and are, is Viber hoping to be like WhatsApp and get bought out? And, and too late for that. To, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, what's happened? So I, I think that, that, to be honest, it's a, a question that's probably, I'm not really answering your question in some respects because it's hard to predict, but there is a paradox of where does the value lie in these apps right now because it's certainly not in the revenue they're generating. Do you, do you have any predictions? We saw that app come to you in the results. Do you have any predictions as to sort of how, how um, scalable the increased buying enterprise or brand trying to reach consumers on offer? No, we haven't looked at that. I think, the, so the question, and I guess this is more of a question, will be how do the brands actually start to reach into the greater, into, into mobile device, you know, through to the mobile consumer. Um, yeah, I think the, the, I think what we will see in Australia is a lot more experimentation over the next short while with things like beacon technology, with location-based services, and it's hard to predict exactly how that will, but there has to be a, and it comes back to the question around enterprise readiness, there has to be a readiness to experiment and see how the consumers react. So you have to be able to test and adjust and, and actually then follow the consumer because this notion of we're all going to be prepared to receive advertising on our phones that are actually targeted to us, we may or we may not. But you, you need to be able to experiment and see how the consumer adjusts and then be able to adjust your how the consumer reacts and then adjust your strategy accordingly. Stu, just, just on that note, um, <clears throat> I know when I was getting involved in Harnessing the Bang, which was our uh, next look at um, our digital disruption, Big Bang Short Fused um, piece of research, we, we looked at what Westfield was doing and their um, beacons that they're actually putting up into their big <coughs> malls. And then today coming in on the bus with the Opal card, you know, to open the doors, mm. Um, it, they only um, they only come alive when you're right by the bus stop, so I presume yeah. that's near field communication. Yeah. So smart city experimentation is pretty close, I would say. I, I, yeah, and the whole internet of everything. There's no doubt that the internet of things 
us. The technology is much closer to us now. Um, and then the question's going to be the, the investment in that and the business case. So we know that globally, the, the really, the, there's, it's very easy to come up with the use cases around the internet of things. The big question is the business case and who pays for it. So that if you think within a smart city environment, who's the payer for the building of the infrastructure? What's the business case for that investment? key is that with things like mobile, with greater adoption and usage of mobile phones, with better use of mobile phones, with near field communication, we're starting to see the next wave of, 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 the, of the, you know, if, and that's why we call it the internet of everything or the internet of things. We're on that cusp of the next wave of what, what we do with technology. Um, but we'll see a lot more. Yeah, we've been talking about RFID for a decade and it's always the business case that falls over. That's one of the predictions, the Patty. <laughs> so I think, you know, Patty, there's, there's no doubt the Internet of Things will be big, but big when and big how is the big question. <laughs> We've fallen mum in the room. Any other questions on the phone, folks? And questions in the room? I'm um, Glenda Crawford from the Australian here. G'day, Glenda. Hi. Um, just in general, then, how, um, how um, advanced do you think Australian business is in um, coming to terms or appreciating the kind of um, the direction that you're um, that you're quantifying? Are they are we behind or ahead? I mean, I think say Common Bank seems to be doing quite well, but there are other other companies um, that good, or you know, are they, are they too slow to perhaps uh, grasp? what you're trying to, um, you know, the evidence you're putting before us. I, um, I think as a general, if you look to indicators such as corporate adoption of the cloud, Australia is in the leading wave of, Australian enterprise is in the leading wave when it comes to that sort of um, thinking. I, I think we're probably middle of the pack when it comes to thinking about consumers and the use of the technology and how they use the technology. Um, so, but I, I, it's very easy to sort of play it to, to get down on Australian companies and say we're lagging. We're, we're not on the very leading edge always, but we're not also the, the laggards either. So, could we do more? Could we be better at thinking about how we deploy mobile technologies to better serve consumers? There's no doubt the answer is yes, but I don't think we could be too down on Australian companies for not being advanced enough. So I don't, you know, when compared to the US, compared to the UK, we're not too bad, but I think the question is always, can we do more and those resources? Yes, to that concern. And which sectors are leading, and, and Stuart? Sorry? Which sectors are leading? Uh, it's a good question, because I, th I think it comes back to individual organisations. I think, uh, you know, I think it's really, you, you look at, we talk about the internet of things, you look at what, um, what mining companies are doing with you know, driverless, uh, you know, basically you know, driverless trucks, etc. They're doing some very interesting things. So I think mining is leading um, uh, where, you know, I think retail, we're middle of the pack. I think banking, we're middle of the pack. I think there's, there's no doubt we're doing some good things, but there's other areas within banking where we can be, we can be lifting um, as well. I don't know whether we saw anything come through but you know I think financial services we're probably middle of the pack so but it comes back to also individual organizations and their response um, as opposed to necessarily an industry based response so the other thing is obviously there's more use of mobiles and smartphones but what you put on them is quite different so you know people aren't going to sit down and read a whole newspaper on the smartphone so um, how does that affect perhaps the nature of the product that you would relate to the smartphone user versus you know, another kind of user? I, I think the key, the, the key is we're, it, it's that the smartphone is dominant, sorry, it's a dominant device from in terms of frequency of use. But the other thing which came out from our earlier survey in the year, we can, we can share these stats offline, um, is that we are um, very much 
we now use multiple devices. So we use our tablets, we use our... So, so I think the key there is that um, you, you've got to understand the role that the device is playing within whatever, you know. So if I'm looking at content, I'm probably not looking at long form content on my mobile phone. I may be looking at it on my tablet so it, it's always in situ, it's always contextual to the moment that I'm in. But also, it also depends, I look at plenty of long form content on my mobile because yeah. it's there yeah. and I'm happy to read. Older yeah. people might be uncomfortable with that and want to use a screen. Yeah. Younger people, they don't care, it's there. Yeah. Was that adequate, Glendo? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions, folks? Glenda, I just um, forwarded you the um, release, the PowerPoint and the um, doc. So hopefully you've got it from my smartphone. <laughs> the only other question I, I want to ask is about the gamification uh, using apps to turn buying and to turn beacons in shopping centres and other places into like a game that encourages you. I spoke to somebody who was telling me all about this in Singapore and other places. And um, I'm presuming you don't know much about it, but you'll have a lot more about it in next year's survey. Yeah, as we start to see that, yeah. Because that, you're trying to get engagement from people, and they've got their phone. And that's this gamification thing we hear about it. We don't receive many good examples, but yeah, I, from what I've heard, I suspect it's really starting. It's going to be big over the next yeah. 12 months. We, we cover that, I think, in our TMT predictions, which is it the 22nd of January we're going to launch that? Um, yeah, the week, of, the week of the 19th of January. Yeah, after yeah. we've had a bit of a yeah. break. Um, but, <laughs> and, and, and also after the guys have gone to um, that CES. CES. Yeah, yeah um, in, in, in the States. So that'll probably be when we're next asking you guys to come on by. Yeah. Um, and um, when, can I just ask one final question? When do we anticipate we'll do this um, media consumer <laughs> survey? Mobile consumer survey again. So it's run, Jeremy. It's run in May, May? Um, this year. So it's likely run the same time frame next year. So we get that information before okay. we review. So we've got the. So yeah, good for that. Very good. Folks, questions? Thank you. I just want to thank you all for coming and thank you very much, Stu Johnson, Jeremy Drum, and Kate Huggins for. Um, leading us through the survey. Guys, if you have any questions at all, flip me a note and I'll um, connect you up with these guys um, or send you whatever I've got that will work. Um, thanks again very much for coming and dialing in. I hope the phone um, was uh, worked okay and thank you so much for muting your phones. We didn't hear a single cough. <laughs> Appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.